Okay, well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we have our faith to fall back on when life really gets tough. We think of Auntie Julia and we pray that you would help her to cope bit by bit and that she would recover sooner than later. We pray that you would comfort her heart during this trying and time where she's experienced so much discomfort. We think of Ting Yi, and we pray that you would give her the strength and wisdom that she's going to need to be there for her family and be there for Grandpa. So we ask that you would grant protection and mercy upon the family members, over in Malaysia especially, that cases rise up to 20,000 a day. And we pray that once again, you would cause us to call out to you in much prayer for deliverance, for restoration of lives. We pray that you would be with us, lift up our hearts and encourage us as we read and study the example of the Lord Jesus once again. Gladden us, we pray, in the midst of all this, as we look to the Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a look at John chapter 4, and we are, hopefully, we can finish this before the holiday comes. Okay, and uh, this is the study on, the focus, remember, is on the personal practice of evangelism. Okay. Now, this is it's very, very focused. We're looking at the personal part. Are there other areas that are there? Hi, hi guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're not talking about prayer. Doesn't mean prayer isn't there. Do we pray? Absolutely. Do we pray that people may come to faith in Christ? Certainly, we should. This is what Paul says. Even as he ministers, he preaches the gospel, he asks the church to pray. Right? So, there's prayer, there's being conscious of the Spirit of God at work. In convic convicting hearts, in uh, enlightening the Spirit of God. Right? So, these are all the other factors that are actually there, behind the scene, that we must be conscious about. Now, what we're looking at is uh, absolutely important because we can pray, we can be conscious of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God will do His part, but what about us? Sometimes, you see, the problem is not because God cannot hear and answer prayer. No, no problem. He can, of course. It's not that the Spirit of God is not working. The problem can lie with us. And we, personal part of it, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to say it. And you know, lacking skill, lacking knowledge, we are, you know, we are not able to do evangelism effectively. So this is why we want to look at Jesus and learn. As much as we possibly can, Right? Will we be like Jesus? A hundred percent. Answer is no. Because <laughs> this is the Lord Jesus Christ. But it must never stop us from learning and saying, well, great, we have literally the perfect example to look at, to study. And you know, let's study it for the rest of our life, the life of Christ. Okay? And, and this particular aspect, how did he help people how, right, to come to faith in God? Okay? Now, we've been looking at the gospel, and then chapter 3, and then chapter 4 now. And we begin to realize, John captures this so well, that evangelism is seldom a straightforward presentation of the gospel. You notice? It's not a straightforward 
uh, okay, let me tell you about uh, salvation, confession of sin, and as if it's a very straightforward process. It didn't happen with, in John 3 with Nicodemus, neither in John 4. Right? So it's not going to be very straightforward. There are times we actually have to deal with sensitive issues. You see, let's take a look at John chapter 4. And the woman responded, well, right? Uh, right? Uh, not, not that she has full understanding, but she at least shown, showing here keen interest, which is good. But where do you go now with keen interest? Okay? Previously is, you no, know, why you talk to me? You are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. So, no, no ghost of a chance there. Now, let me uh, tell you about the gift of God. Now, she begins to warm up, open up to Jesus. Now, she shows keen interest by even saying that she wants what Jesus is offering her. But she doesn't quite get what it is either. Right? So, in verse uh, we, we read in verse 15, the woman said, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now, where would you go from here? Now, interesting. Jesus deals with a fairly sensitive issue that actually needs to be dealt with. It will be on the subject of sin. It will be have to do with her personal life. See, a lot of the time people try to avoid that. Don't, don't, it's too sensitive. And let's don't deal with sin. Don't deal with the person's lifestyle. Just say all the nice things. Jesus was not afraid to deal with sensitive issues like this. Because you need to. How would a person uh, recognize that they need a saviour if they don't see their sins? We often present a saviour. We present heaven. We present, uh, you know, God will bless you. But why do I need a saviour? If I'm not conscious of my sins, even. But how did the Lord Jesus Christ deal with it is something that we can and must learn. Okay? Now, if we look at this very, very carefully, it really is quite uh, amazing. See, Jesus would speak directly, but never coarse, never crude. Right? He would always speak the truth, but always gracious, not condemning. Now, there's the difference. See, even as Jesus talked to her, he talks very, very candidly, but not crude. He tells her the truth, but she doesn't feel that Jesus is judging me. You've got to see, how did he do it? Now, there is interesting. So we read, Jesus said to her in verse 16, Go call your husband and come here. Right? Now, this is uh, a very gracious invitation. See, in the heart and mind of Jesus, it's not just the Samaritan woman. It's all man. It's everyone. He would even reach out. He's reaching out to not just Samaritan woman, but the man you are staying with also bring. And a lot of the time we look at it, you look at the person's life and we, you know, do we even want to reach out to them? Now, there is truly the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is actually a invitation. Go call your husband. 
When well, the woman replied and said, "I have no husband." Short, sharp, no further discussion. Right? She is not about to go on further talking about this. Right? Did not elaborate further. Just said, "I have no husband." Okay. Well, let's see what the, Jesus says. And then Jesus said to her, "You have." Well said. Now, interesting. And then said, say to her, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. Now, this is very candid, very direct truth. All right. So Jesus tells her what. He knows of her, and um, as point blank as point blank can be, there's no fudging it. There's nothing but saying it in a way, um, not condemning her. It's like this is what it is, isn't it? And yet, uh, in that you said no husband, you spoke the truth, even commending her for telling the truth. That's interesting. You see, this is not something to be proud about. You know how many husbands I have. This is five failed relationships, five divorces, and the current person that she is living with is not even her husband. Meaning, she is in those days. It is a real, uh, a great taboo. She will be very poorly regarded by the whole, you know, everyone in society in the society there. Right? If she was living in Israel, she would be probably be stoned. And there she was. Well, have it, when when Jesus said what he did, how did she reply? Now that's interesting. Was she shocked? Was she, uh, you know, how did she feel? Bad? What what did she feel? Now her reply is really quite interesting. She said. The woman said to him, "Sir, or Lord, I perceive that you are a prophet." Now that's an interesting reply. She was impressed, not that she is, you know, like gloating about her, you know, her circumstance in life. She certainly isn't. But she recognizes the insight that is in Jesus. See, the prophets are known to be men of God who have insight. And to her, she said, "You must be one of the prophets." And then she went on to uh, uh, say. Um, Our fathers worship on this mountain. Now, notice uh, she changed the subject, <laughs> right? Jesus said, "Call your husband." Eh? How did it went from husband marital to worship? Okay, so not every so this is a very touchy subject, and she is not ready to talk further. She's not ready to discuss her marital affairs. But she has an issue she wants to raise up with Jesus. Now, what would the Lord Jesus do? You know what Jesus did? Went with her. He literally talked about the other subject. Okay, you're not ready for this one? Okay, let's, let's go on to, let's work with where you are. And that is a very sensitive, very gracious, very kind approach. See, not forceful, not putting her down, not running her down. Knows that this is her life. And yet, you know what? 
speak to her truthfully. This is what it is. Right? And so she felt that um, you know, she's, she's not about to uh, talk further on this, but she does have something that she wants to deal with. So, you know, you help pe- we help people deal with wherever you are ready. Rather than, you know, if you're not ready, you're not ready to talk about it. Don't force people to talk about something that they are not ready to talk about. Jesus didn't say, well, tell me a bit more about the man you're living with. You know, why are we changing subject? He didn't. Well, the woman say, uh, okay, now, I perceive you to be a prophet. Now, while I'm on this subject of prophets, can I ask you a question? You are inside, and you are a man of God. You have insight, like the prophets. You must be a prophet. Can I ask you a question? Now, there is an issue that has, is really bothers not just her, but all the Samaritans and the Jews. This has been an issue that has not been resolved, by the way, till today. This tension continues. Right? And what is this tension about? It has to do with worship. Right? So these are touch, touchy subjects. One, personal life. Two, religion, worship. And today, you see, we, we come to a place where, okay, don't, don't, don't talk touchy subject. Let's talk about things that I don't relate. No, let's deal with real issues. As much as you can, as ready as you can. If you're not ready to talk about the mar- marriage part, okay, now let's, let's deal with this wherever you are ready. So Jesus dealt with this part of it. And so she said, Sir, our fathers worship on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now, there we go. Okay, so this mountain is a reference to uh, Mount Gerizim. Okay, which is um, synonymous to Samaritan worship. This is their sacred place. Okay, it's uh, under UNESCO today. <laughs> Known, Samaritan, Mount Gerizim, uh, well, this is their holy ground. This is their sacred place. As with Israel, Jerusalem is called the Holy Land, right? Pilgrims go there the temple of the mount, to do the Jews. Whereas the Samaritans, it's not there. It's Mount Gerizim. Today, a small group lives there. It's the Palestinians. So today, there's still that tension all the way back to here and even further. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, descendants. Of. So you can see... The, the battle continues. It hasn't ended. It's just a small group there. But you look, the tension that, is, that you, you think is, is so easy, talk to them and they'll be resolved, get the US in. You've got to be kidding. You are talking about a contention that go back centuries. Right? So we got to see. Now, what is the contention? We have a glimpse here and... Uh, has to do with worship, Samaritan worship, okay? And uh, on this mountain, you see, Mount Gerizim is where Moses uh, declared uh, the blessings of God. That's where it was. So they say, our fathers, meaning Moses. And to the Samaritan, even goes further. Remember when um, uh, Abraham was to offer his son to be sacrificed, right? Now, if you go back to the text, it's uh, the land of Moriah. The Samaritans claim is Mount Gerizim. The altar was actually Mount Gerizim. That's where the Samaritans claim. In, they, they have their history too. Their tradition is Mount Gerizim. 
Whereas the Jews is Mount Moriah, where uh, you know, Solomon built the temple uh, in Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah, and uh, they say this is where Abraham offered his son. Now, of course, nobody really know where the exact location is. It just say in the land of Moriah. I mean, the land is just so big, which part? Right? Neither did he make a little marking. This is the place. So, it only comes down to traditionally, culturally, passed down. This was the sacred place. This is the holy ground. And so it has developed until there is a sacredness about it that this is the place where one ought to worship God. And this creates a lot of contention between the Samaritans and the Jews. Right? So this is the issue over here. By the way, today we have the same problem if you want to look at it. Right? Over in the aged care, I, um, you know, after the Bible study uh, yesterday, uh, one lady said to me, have you been to the place where Jesus was crucified? I said, no, I haven't been to Israel. Say, I have. I go there every year. She's referring to Golgotha. Right? You know, we will go there. We will go up the hill. You know, every Easter we go there. And uh, of course, now she can't go. But you see, to her, it's all part of her worship. You know, as if worship is richer because you're there. Ah, Nobody knows the exact place. Israel was destroyed. And it was flattened. Today, there's a number of archaeological sites. This is a possibility. This is a possibility. This is a possibility. It's been built on top. Right? Now, right of course, at this point, there's a church that is there that says this is the place where Jesus was crucified, and it become, literally becomes a relic, a holy ground for pilgrims all over the world. To go there, and then they feel uh, there's a spiritual part of being there. You see, we have the same thing in the days of Jesus. To them, it's the temple in Jerusalem. Because of Abraham, because of you know, David, Solomon, so there is a very strong traditional attachment. So this lady tells her, my husband always bring us there. Well, you know, it's become a Roman Catholic tradition. So this becomes their worship. Right? Here, the Samaritans have them, tradition, passed down, uh, you know, practices, and it's sensitive because it, this is there where it, the difference, there is contention, there is conflict, painfully. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> when you talk to people, and you know, not everybody, some people, they are, it's going to be difficult because they have a religious background. They feel this is how God is to be worshipped. Why your church Worship like this, because this is meant to be how God is to be worshipped. And we've had that challenge where people come in and ask, where's your cross? How come your church don't have cross? And so my reply is, there's one big one outside, did you miss it? I say, but what is it not one in here? So they look for things. Where's your holy water? There's the tap water. <laughs> Where's your, see, there becomes an issue and it stumbles them. This Samaritan woman, same thing. These things can actually stumble a person. Right? So how did Jesus answer? Right? So well, we say, our fathers, uh, say, on this mountain, but you Jews, the only place, the one place, the emphasis, where one ought to worship is Jerusalem. So who's right, who's wrong, in other words? Okay, I, I like how Jesus answer. And that is really something we must learn. Okay, there is knowledge here. There is understanding here. 
watch this part of it. Okay? And so he said to her, woman, now this is a very nice way of addressing her. It's not saying woman as in a very crude, harsh way. Remember when Jesus said to the uh, mother, woman, what have I to do with you? <laughs> it's not a nasty way. It's addressing her as she is. Right? And saying very gently, very graciously to her, believe me. Can you trust me? Now, that is a word used, belief. Would you believe me if I tell you this? Okay? Now, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Now, that sums the truth of what Jesus wants to share with her. Right? About worship. You ask about worship, well, let me tell you something about worship. Worship is not confined to a place. Not this mountain, nor Jerusalem. It's not about Samaritan worship or Jewish worship. It's about true worship. It's not Roman Catholic worship, it's not Presbyterian worship, it's not Baptist worship, it's not charismatic worship. You see, a lot of people got get caught up with this about the form or the place of worship. What's the focus? What's true worship? Right? And true worship is not confined to a place. Now, not that the place is not important. Now, Jesus explains here, historically, again, once again, sharing truth, sharing facts. Okay? So, saying to her, now, let's, let's take a look at this. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know. Now, there is a problem. She, she lacks knowledge. So, this is very gently correcting Right? Her knowledge is made up of traditions, of culture passed down. Now, this is sharing with her knowledge. We worship what we, uh, we know what we worship. And then says, for salvation is of the Jews. Okay? Now, this is important. Okay? To this is to really help her to uh, get the historical part. What is the historical worship that needs to... It began in Jerusalem. Right? When we talk about the historical worship of a nation, is it wrong? Is Jerusalem wrong? It isn't. There was a time where... Uh, you know, Abraham did not worship in Jerusalem, worship wherever he was. But there came a time where God uh, had, they became a nation. So there is a national worship. So the place that was chosen was Jerusalem, established by the Lord. Right? And so, interesting, worship is now tied in with salvation because Salvation and worship are closely related. Every time historical Jewish worship is done, it is a reminder of God's salvation all the time. Whether it's the Passover worship. Because they will be bringing the sacrifices and then offering it to God, a reminder of the sins of their need for God's salvation. You see, the problem today is worship has become like entertainment. The focus is not even salvation anymore. It's, oh, I need to feel the presence of God, whatever that means to a person. See, when we say we, feel, we sense the presence of God, it's not quite always the same when somebody I, I, what is the presence of God? They're just looking for the emotional part of worship. They're looking for the musical part of worship. 
and yet the idea of salvation is completely missing. We worship what we know. You do not know what you worship. See, worship must be correctly, properly understood. So there is Jesus dealing with this subject of worship with them. So is it about thanksgiving? Yes. But it's not just, thank you God for the week, it's been wonderful, great, we offer worship. A big part of worship, every time we can come to worship, it is a reminder of God's salvation. Because of His salvation, we can come to the throne of grace to worship Him. That's a big part. So salvation is of the Jews first. It began there. It is not to end there, but it began there. Right? It is meant to be for all mankind. But God would begin somewhere with Abraham, with the nation, and then reach the world. That has always been God's plan. It was not meant to be just for Israel. Now, this one is historically true. This is where it began. Now, here is the new understanding that is added in. So there's the historical part. You see, the place historically will always change. There will be changes. But the truth and the spirit never change. And so this understanding must now be given. And so the Lord Jesus said to her, in verse 23, the hour is coming. And now is, now is mean the hour is now. That when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now that is what we are looking at. Okay, For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. This must be the focus. What is the spirit of worship? All right? So, is, is the place of worship important? Yes. But worship is not confined to a place. Is Jerusalem important to the Jewish people? Yes. There's nothing wrong with it. It is not dismissing it. Historically, culturally, Jesus is not dismissing it. But you know, what is really important is what kind of worship is God looking for? Who, what worshipper is God looking at, looking for? The worship that God desires. One, true worshippers. That is an important note. God is always looking for true worshippers. It's not just a keeping of tradition. It's not just offering sacrifices for sacrifices sake, but true worshippers. People who have experienced the salvation of God. People who are grateful children of God and they offer true worship. Right? We read in the book of Isaiah how God was angry with His people. He rejected their worship. On the one hand, they bring their sacrifices. See, it's a tradition, it's a practice. This is called religious part of it. We practice, we keep this. But their lifestyle, they didn't deal with their sins. See, same with the Samaritan woman. Even though there's sins in her life, she, she can talk about worship, but she's not dealing with her sins. And so let's begin here. Very skillfully, Jesus deals with what she wants to deal with. Okay, worship. And then salvation is of the Jews. That is an important aspect. 
He's not talking about the form of worship. He's talking about what is the spirit of true worship. God is looking for true worshippers. What is a true worshipper? They worship God in spirit. What is our spirit like? Is there a spirit of faith? Is there a spirit of righteousness? Is there a spirit of holiness? What is the inside? What are you really like inside? And God has to cleanse us, regenerate us, restore us. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. See, this must ring a bell to her. Inside, not outward, not mountain, but inside you. Must worship in spirit and in truth. There must be truth. Right? You come to God in truth. You come to God believing in the truth. Right? So these things must be corrected. The truth of God, the truth about worship, about salvation must be appreciated, understood in spirit, and in truth. You have these two things. God is there to bless you. You are a true worshipper. And this is something that we all need to understand, all of us. See, thank God for a church. We really thank God. But in the time where we live in a pandemic, at any point we can go into lockdown this becomes a problem where you know, people can feel because I'm not at church, I do not find the same kind of closeness and connection. I don't even feel like I'm worshipping God because I'm not at church. You see, we're so, still so tied in with just the place. We need to understand that worship of God there is a place, but what if we cannot go to the place? Can we have meaningful worship in spirit and in truth? This has got to be learned in a time like this even more. Right? Even more. And we are not going to, okay, we must open the church because only in the church you can worship God. Who cares about COVID-19? Who cares about we must open the place? That would be a disaster. What Jesus said is absolutely right. Worship in spirit and in truth. Right? So this is absolutely vital to understand here. And he emphasized it again. He says, God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. This is the emphasis. And so the woman replied and said to Him, I know that, the Messi the, that Messiah is coming, okay, which is translated, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Now that is interesting. How come she responded like that? What Jesus said to her triggered something that is inside her. It triggered a, the messianic hope. The hope, her belief in the Messiah. Now, now that is really wonderful to see. Okay, so the response of the Samaritan woman is worth noting. She expresses hope. And every time you see hope, there is also faith. Hope and faith goes together. Right? Her hope in the Messiah, 
She just don't know who he is. But her hope is certainly in the concept, in the truth about the Messiah. What does she hope? She believes that the Messiah is coming. And there's the prophecy that was there. Remember, they also believe in the prophecies. They believe in Abraham, in Moses' writings. They share the same thing. The contention comes down to places of worship, practices of worship. Right? And so, now, she goes back to truth. Remember? Spirit and truth. What Jesus said to her. Salvation. All these things triggered something. And she st- began to say, speak about the Messiah. Right? Now, her hope in the Messiah is when He comes, He will tell us all things. Now that is a wonderful hope to have. That the Messiah will reveal to us truth from God. See, this is what we take for granted. But it's there. When we come to faith in Christ, the Lord Jesus is actually the one who reveals truths. Right? Thank God that the truths of God, of life, spiritual matters, the Lord will reveal things to us. And that was where she uh, you know, was really hanging on to that hope. And then we read, Jesus says these words to her. Right? Very simply, I who speak to you am He. Now that is a, uh, you know, that is really quite something. Basically revealed, you want to talk about uh, the Messiah will come and reveal things to you when He comes, right? Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> the one you are talking to, I am the Messiah. See, when we talk about Jesus coming to reveal things to us, It's good to have that hope, believing in it. But what exactly is He going to reveal? And one of the most wonderful things that Jesus could reveal to us is Himself, who He is. And then, you know, we, uh, you know, she at this point will we will read next week, uh, hopefully, the disciples at this point. And then they came in, there's a bit of uh, intervention, uh, you know, there's a bit of a a gap here, and then we see her response. But we will take up this study next week. Okay? Now, let's just take a look at some of the vital lessons that are there, and then I'll be happy to uh, uh, give you the time to look at questions. Okay? So what are some vital lessons that we can learn as we study this. Okay, one, look at reaching out. Reaching out, not always straightforward. This is not a straightforward presentation of the gospel. And we think, okay, to do evangelism is to share the gospel. Okay, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about this. And one, two, three, four. And okay, anyone want to be baptized? Okay, now that's it. We often think it's a straightforward presentation. It isn't. A very skillful evangelist will often identify the needs. Work with where you're at. Right? So this is personal evangelism. Open interaction with the people. With, in this case, Jesus with the Samaritan. And then uh, addressing issues along the way. You need to deal with them. You need to deal with the problem of sin. You need to look at uh, salvation until the person really is convicted in their own heart who the Messiah is and He has already come. Okay, So reaching out is never a straightforward thing. Now what is really needed is communication skills. This is where sometimes 
we are, are lacking and we can really learn from the Lord. How did Jesus speak? See, a lot of the time we beat around the bush and that doesn't help. That really doesn't help. We take a long way of getting there. Right? Look at Jesus. He was just direct. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't fudge things either. He's very truthful. He'll say it as it is. He presents the truth of who God is. You ask about worship, I'll tell you what worship is. Right? Historically, spiritually, what it is. There are two parts. From history, because you need to know the facts. And then a spiritual part to it as well. But how did Jesus do it? Graciously. Did it beautifully, helping the lady come to the point where he could help her know who she was talking to. That is impact. Right? So there is skill. And an evangelist needs communication skill. It's not just handing tracts, Bible tracts, or just reading the scriptures even. You need to know how to communicate. And we're not talking about marketing kind of communicate. Jesus' way of communicating is always direct and yet with dignity. Truthful and yet gracious. Now that is wonderful. Okay? And then the third part of it is look at how Jesus would always give the opportunity to respond. Never push, never hurry, but you need, we need to give people opportunity, time to think through the truths that are shared. Right? You need to uh, you know, encourage small steps of faith along the way. And that's what Jesus did. Right? From God who gives living water, now let me encourage it one step at a time, to the Messiah, she's able to respond. The Messiah who's going to come is going to reveal all these things. Now, another step. See, it's one step at a time. It's never a big jump to a decision. Bit by bit. Time is needed. Encouragement every step of the way. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ did evangelism. Right? Which is absolutely wonderful. Okay? Right. Any questions you want to raise up? Any uh, over to you to, for interaction, or observation, uh, questions you want to ask on this, on what we have been learning? Okay, any, any, anything you want to ask on, on how to put it together, how do you practice it, on what we are looking at? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Victor. Um, Pastor Chris Mann's just the historical one. So yep. Are the Samaritans not, um, when you say are salvations of the Jews, yep. are the Sam because I remember, like we're learning, the, for example, the Northern Kingdom. Yep. Uh, Samaria was the capital. Yep. Of, at one point, so I was just—I thought the Samaritans were part of Israel. Yeah. yeah so I was just wondering. Historically, uh, they are all God's people. Yes. But in the days of uh, after Solomon, when they became divided, it's like North Korea, South Korea, actually all Koreans. But if you say to a South Korean, are you, which part of Korea are you from? They can get very angry with you. Technically, yes. But because of the history, the division, they have become so divided. So divided that um, it's now north and south. That's the problem. So your capital is you know, Jerusalem. Well, we go back and we choose another capital, we trace the scripture, there's where is where Moses declared his blessing, 
So we will pick uh, Mount Gerizim in Samaria. So that becomes a problem, right? Well, you look at today, uh, Victor, even though we say we all believe in God, we are, you know, believe in the Bible, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are so divided. <laughs> there are so many denominations, so many different practices. Are we all not the same? Actually, yeah. And yet, no. Right? Are we, is salvation, see, when Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, he is not saying that, uh, you know, it, it came from, yeah, you are not. See, the term Jew must be understood here as not a general reference, but here is Samaritans, Jews. North Korea, South Korea. Right? That's the idea here. They, you, division. Now, when he says salvation is of the Jew, you trace it back to what does it mean to be a Jew. All the way back, this is where it came from. Historically, Jerusalem. So he's looking more at history, the first part of it. And, and factually, right? All the way back, it's from is there. So, nothing wrong with that. Is the problem is they begin to, um, you know, selected history. The, so, the Samaritans have their own, by the way, they have their own tradition, their own interpretation of the Pentateuch. It's a little bit different. Like, one of them is with reference to uh, where exactly did Abraham offer Isaac? They will say Mount Gerizim. So it's like in favor of, right? To, to make this place holy. And then there, actually historically, uh, it probably leaned more towards Mount Moriah. So let's, let's get this fact, factually. Let's go back to it. Salvation is of the Jews, but not limited to the Jews. It was meant to be for all. That's where Jesus was coming from. Let's look at the historical aspect first before we can understand the spiritual aspect. Let's correct the historical part of it. Right? He's not defending Jewish tradition. He is just stating what the scripture actually says. Right? Notice he speaks about salvation rather than the religious practice where all worship come from the Jews. He goes even further. Salvation. If we don't understand salvation, if we are not appreciative of salvation, what is worship? We miss worship, the point of worship, totally. It's not a feel-good session. It's not just, okay, I come to church, I worship God. Every time, the whole idea of salvation is the reminder of our salvation in Christ. How can we worship a holy God? Because of salvation that God offers us. Does that, make, does that help you to understand the part? Yes, they technically they all belong to uh, together, right? And yet divided. So a lot of this has to do with the you got to read Kings and Chronicles. They began to they worse than enemies. They would they would even call the Egyptian brothers and want to fight the they want to fight each other. They want to kill each other. That's really painful. Really, really painful. When you see the brother as an enemy, you look at Afghanistan today, it's just so painful. They're killing each other. Are they not the same people, actually, technically speaking? But there's the Taliban, then there's the Afghans, and then there is... Uh, within it, you, you, you must know that the Taliban are not the only 
they, they are in the Islamic State, they are more radical people than the Taliban. They look at the Taliban and say, you guys are not hardcore enough. It is so splintered into so many different groups and they're warring and fighting each other. Actually, they're all the same group of people. Historically. Right? You killed my brother, you, you know, attacked my family. You... It's, it's the same problem today. Right? So Jesus chose to focus not on the differences, but that which really unites us all a God who offers salvation. We all need that. It is not about the Jew or the Samaritan or the place. Spirit, truth, true worshippers. A true worshipper can be a Samaritan. A true worshipper can be a Jew, a Gentile, whoever, but a true worshipper. That is the focus. Right? Right? Okay, any, any other questions you want to raise up? Anything? Okay, well, I, I hope this has been an enlightening, helpful for us to learn further. Okay, now look at it. It is not as straightforward. Okay, let me present the gospel. Seldom it goes that way. You talk to the person. That's what I do. We talk to people. We see where they're coming from. Right? We explain things where it's needed. It could be on worship. It could... It much depends on how much the person will open up. If the person is not comfortable, we won't press on either. We won't push it. We'll approach it in another way. Right? No, you're not ready. She, she's, she wasn't ready to talk about her personal uh, life, but that's very too, too sensitive, too much hurt maybe. But she can talk about worship. Okay, let's talk about worship. Right? wherever the person is ready, but pointing them to God, to God who offers living water, to a God who offers life, to God who offers salvation. Right? That we may be able to understand all these things in the Messiah. Okay? You just look at it. You've got to Again, ponder it through. Look at, you know, go back and ponder it again. How Jesus reached out is really amazingly skilled. Very, very, very skilled. Very sensitive. Truly the spirit of God's, uh, you know, wise discerning. And this is what we, we must seek to be. <laughs> really seek to be. Okay, well... Try and, and pray and work at it. Learn to speak well. This is why it's so important. Learn to be, uh, speak that which is you know, in a way that is kind and gracious and yet uh, not, not flattery, not deviating from truth. You know, we will say it, but we will say it you know, pointedly, directly, but with dignity, with grace, with compassion. For the other per side, for the person, not snobbing the person, not running them down. Now, that is evangelism. Okay, Jesus had no hate for the Samaritan, obviously, just love. Now that's how we reach out, where there is love for the person you're reaching out to. Okay, all right. Well, we pray together. Uh, before we go. Father, we thank you that we can read and ponder how Jesus reached out. And we have so much to learn from the Lord Jesus himself in the way he cared, in the way he loved, in the way he would communicate so pointedly, so graciously to helping this woman to come to faith. May we learn from the Lord Jesus himself that we too would be effective evangelists for you. We ask that you would bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.